Welcome back. Um, so before I, I start, uh, continue through the material that, um, from yesterday, I just wanted to say so, to talk briefly about the uh, the elliptic problem that, that people were doing in the you're working on in the lab and the exercises. Uh, how many people solved the first problem and saw second order convergence? Okay, so a few, a few people. Okay, uh, how many people solved the second problem and saw second order convergence? All right, just I, I had no idea how you know long it would take to do these problems. Or, you know what would be involved. So, so that's good to know. So one thing I, I did want to just repeat because this was basically a, a problem which I think most people had um, was this idea of, of exactly what you're including and what you're not including in, in your solution. So if you have a, uh, a problem where you have some computational domain, uh, which in this case went from 0 to 1, okay, we had uh, specified that we'd chosen a, a cell-centered grid. So these, these grid points, you know, evenly spaced, and this is a, a 1 minus h, I guess, right? So it's, it's set up like this. And you have specified boundary conditions. You're, you're given, you're, you know, you're asked to solve this problem with particular boundary conditions, which were that, that u of 0 is 0, and, and u of 1 is 0. And so you are told that. So the, the goal, of course, is to solve uh, is to find this function at, at you know, the, the grid points. And so, uh, in some sense, the, these two points, 0 and 1, are, are places where you also want the solution. You want the solution from 0 to 1. But you know these already. They're given to you. Okay? And so, um, you, do not, you don't need to, to solve the equations here for this point, because you already have the solution. Okay? And so when you then write down your, uh, this matrix problem, okay, you, you end up with this particular matrix, but the matrix is, um, is supposed to represent, it's a convenient way of writing out all the equations that you are trying to solve. Okay? And so you then say, if I label these points, i equals 0, 1, 2, and so on, okay? You don't need to solve for i equals 0, and you don't need to solve for i equals. Uh, now, I, the numbering is always comp n, right? <laughs> okay, you don't need to solve for n. And then you say, okay, what is the equation here? Well, here for your operator, it's, you know, u, for this at i equals 1, it's u0 plus u2 minus 2u1 squared is f, and then you say, ah, well, I know u0 is 0, so I can cancel that out, and so that's my operator there. Everywhere else, for i2 to, I guess, in minus 2, in some sense, right, to this point here, uh, this is, right, for all those points, you now have u of And that's the operator that you are solving. And then for the very the last point before the end, i equals n minus 1, you write this out again. So now it's u of n minus u of n. OK. And now you say, well, u of n is 0. So again, I've got that. And so now I've... I've Sorry? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. No. No. Ah, sorry. Plus. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. Uh, right. So you, you so now you have this operator for the whole system, and this is and that's it. Okay. And you solve from i equals one to i equals n minus one. So this is the thing that you need to write a, 
you write out essentially this matrix for, and this is what you, you solve. And so one of the most the common problems was that, and, it, and then it turns out that this is very, uh, becomes very easy because these, ter these, these pieces would actually not normally be in the matrix anyway because they're somehow off the edge. And so that you end up with this very simple uh, 1 minus 2, 1 pattern all the way through and you don't have to modify it in any, any way. But you're solving it for only these things. So the, the most common mistake, and I think almost, almost everyone made, the, made this error at, at some point, was to actually construct the matrix to solve from 0 to 1 and then and you and, and then it's inconsistent then it's the you're solving the wrong problem because if you solve if you write down the operator here at i equals 0 you now need to well you know this is 0 but you don't know anything about this one this is off the edge, and so uh, I mean, you could you could you, knowing what your boundary condition is, you could do some cook up some way of making an approximation for this, and then you could then modify your matrix accordingly. Uh, but that would that's unnecessary because you you know the value here, okay? Uh, and so what you end up doing if you by including these points in, in the solution as you were doing, you're essentially solving now solving a system uh, for which the solution is zero. At, at this point, this extra, at these points off the edge, okay. Now that's okay. You could so if you solve the system such that the solution is zero here and here. Then, as you increase the resolution, this point, these points move closer and closer to the actual boundaries. And so, as you increase the resolution, you will actually get closer to the correct solution, because your where you're imposing your boundary condition is getting closer. Uh, to 0 and 1, okay? And so you will actually get the correct solution eventually, but it will, conv it will converge linearly, right, with H. So that will be first-order convergence. And so a lot of people were seeing first-order convergence, and uh, often there were other reasons, but one reason that was common was that you, you were effectively imposing the bound conditions at, at the wrong points, okay? Um, and I would guess that the the main lessons that's come out of all of this is that the, the key trick in doing these kinds of problems is, is getting very clear what all your indices mean, getting everything lined up correctly, and uh, correctly implementing the boundary conditions. Okay. Uh, are there any comments or questions about, about that? Because, uh, yes? Suppose you solved it by this grid, and then you did a staggered which you also explained yesterday. Yes. Does one expect it to be both of them to give similar results, or can they be very different? Or? Well, uh, you expect if you've done it consistently, you expect both of them to converge uh, at second order. Um, I, I think I. I, I think that would be pretty much equivalent. It wouldn't make much difference. I mean, you. I mean, this is a the, the, this. Problem is not very taxing on the method in a sense, right? So if you certainly you can in more more complex problems, and certainly when you get thinking which are in more dimensions, and you have maybe have problems where you want you know in spherical coordinates where you have regularity problems at the origin, all sorts of things, then these different choices can make a a, a significant difference. But here, I'm sure one basically one must work better than the other. It's it's hard to believe they work exactly equally well, but uh, I don't, I think it's luck in this case. Right? Okay. Any other comments? Uh, any? Okay. If anyone wants to sort of wail with pain over this, you can also, well, you can leave that for later, actually. Okay. Um, all right. Let's continue. I, mean, I think the other thing to say about these numerical methods, I mean, it's like just about anything else, right, is that it's, it's mostly about, about practice and about being, uh, being, being familiar with it. So once you have solved, uh, gone through the pain of solving a number of these kinds of problems, 
right? If you came, came back and got the problem like you had yesterday, you, you know, you'd code it up in 10 minutes, right? And it's just having done it many times and have somehow all of the, the tricks, you know, sink into your brain and, and all of the mistakes that you could possibly make, you've made. And, uh, and also debugging, being able to debug, right? You see something go wrong and you immediately have in your head a list of things. Okay, there are three things I, I'm almost certain went wrong here and then you can go and check those things. And, and this is just purely um, experience. The other trick to mention is always do things as simply as possible. Certainly first, right? So if you have a, you say, okay, I'm, I'm going to do this in a very sophisticated and fancy way, that's, that's great. But try and do it so that at first you do it in the simple way and then you build up the complexity. Because if you write yourself a massive code that does a very, is going to do the things in a very fancy way and it doesn't work, then you suddenly have this huge code to debug. So you really want something to, to do things uh, in, in steps um, of, of increasing sophistication. And of course, if you've got the solution that you want to the accuracy you want with a very simple code, then there's no need to make it more complicated. Right? It's, 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 I mean, if, you want, if you're a masochist, that's fine, but it's not, a, it's not required. Okay, all right, so the, to continue from where we were yesterday, I was, I was talking about this uh, radial equation. Uh, so. And so here, uh, first thing I wanted to do was just talk about the, the behavior of the solution and what we expect from it before we, we solve. And one of the reasons you want to do this is because you certainly don't want to spend a lot of time writing a code to solve an equation that doesn't have a solution, right? Or has a solution of a completely different character to what you, you expect and, and requires a different method. So it's very important and very useful to, to, to Get some picture of what the solution is going to be like before you uh, solve. Um, okay, so the if we you know, assume this is essentially a repeat from yesterday that um, this is, if we assume that near the origin the solution uh, behaves with some power of r, right? And this could be positive or negative. That's fine. It could be could be blowing up or it could be going to zero. It's just um, if some power of r, then we know that squared phi will go as will go as uh, n minus two, and then as r goes to zero, um, the right hand side uh, behaves as r squared. And clearly, this this part becomes negligible for very small r, and so this just goes to 0 as r squared. And so therefore, phi, well, therefore n equals 4, right? So, uh, so the solution must uh, uh, behave as something like r to the 4 near the, the origin. Except, of course, for any any terms which could be killed off by this operator and anything that's in the kernel of the operator. And so what's in the, the kernel of this, what, what gets eliminated by this operator is a constant. Of course, if you take, if you take one derivative, you've already thrown out the constant. And also the other thing that's in here is, is 1 over r. So if you feed 1 over r into this, uh, you, you know, it becomes 0, right? So, um, Okay, so we can say that in general, the solution, it could have a constant, it could have a, a, a divergent one over r piece, um, and after the, beyond that, it, it must go as r to the, sorry, there's going to be a constant there as well, and we'll do the c, r to the 4. Okay, all right. Now, this one over r piece, uh, well, we will see actually that there's not going to be a, with the boundary conditions that we have, um, well, we can essentially eliminate this with our boundary conditions. So, the, um, so that won't actually be a problem. Okay. 
Uh, right, so now we look at. Oh. You mean R, one over R to the one over R squared or something? You mean? Because well, because that's not in the uh, this piece here is 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 um, uh, the, the the trivial solution. This is automatically eliminated by this operator, right? So whatever source term is over here, this this can be in here, okay? And it's this, the, and this doesn't tell you anything about it, right? But if you take one over R squared or one over R cubed. This is not eliminated by this operator, right? And so if, so that, if you had 1 over r squared, this would, would give you something that goes as 1 over r to the 4. And that would have to match with the right-hand side. There's no 1 over r to the 4 in the right-hand side near the origin. So that's not there, OK? So, so this term is just, some, these are just two pieces we, don't, we cannot, from the, the argument we've made so far, we cannot determine these pieces. They just, they may or may not be there. But we do know that. Apart from those, the rest of the solution must go as r to the 4. Okay? All right. So now we look at the other end. So r goes to infinity. And you might say, ah, I'm going to apply the same kind of argument. And I can see that as... Um, at large r, this thing falls off as 1 over r to the 4. Uh -huh. And so by this argument, um, by a similar argument here, the solution must fall off as 1 over r squared. That's what you would think would come from there. But, but this is not what happens. Uh, because if you think of this like um, uh, a, um, a Newtonian gravity example, right? Then in Newtonian gravity, you would write down, or in, I mean, you can do the same thing in electromagnetism, right? That you, if you write it like this, right? Then um, the mass right? That's, the, that's your, your, um, your mass. And so then the solution, and so then, and then so if you've got some mass, some non-zero mass, then the potential for some m Right? You know that the potential is going to be, uh, the gravitational potential is going to be a game over R. Okay? And so uh, if we take a look at our example, right? So um, the rho, this is going to be. Right? This is going to be the equivalent calculation, right? And here, uh, rho is greater than zero everywhere. So rho dv is greater than zero, right? But we don't have to calculate this integral, right? I'm just making the argument that we can see that this has a a positive, if you think in terms of a mass, it has a positive mass. Okay? And so, so there must be a 1 over r. Uh, asymptotically, there has to be a 1 over r piece to the solution. Right? You can just think of it as, as the potential outside some, some mass distribution. Um, right? Or you can think of it as the, the electric potential outside some charge distribution, whatever you want. It's, right? And so, uh, so as infinity phi has to, go, has to be some, has to have some 1 over r fall off. Okay? 
So our solution, we know what it, we have some picture of what it looks like at, at the origin, and we have some picture of what it looks like at, uh, uh, at, at large R. Okay, so just to, so one thing we want to uh, I want to check here is what kind of boundary conditions are appropriate to the solution. So, for example, you might say, well, I'm going to make I'm going to choose a boundary condition that that eliminates this one over R term because I don't want that solution. I want a nice regular solution. And to make life simple, I'm also going to to require actually that the solution is zero at the origin, right? And I'm going to kill off this term. And what we'll see actually is that the first is fine, but that this is inconsistent. You ca cannot get a, um, a non-trivial solution by imposing that um, it's zero at the origin. Okay? So, um, right. So now, okay. Yes. Is it the same argument uh, where, where uh, the, for r tends to 0? Yes. Uh, we can apply the same argument and say that phi goes to 1 over r plus r, rather 1 by r as r goes to infinity. That it goes as 1 over r? 1 over r square. The same, <laughs> the same argument. L square phi equals uh, to r to the power n minus 2. Right. So this right. So this tells you that right. So this argument gives you one over r to the n minus two, right? But again, it doesn't tell you about a one over r term. Right? You've always got, you can always put in a, a constant piece and a one over r piece in the solution. Okay. And so so this argument never tells you about the, those two pieces. And from this argument here, we can see that there the, indeed has to be a one over r term. Okay. So to if you were to say, okay, I'm going to actually impose that there is not a 1 over r part to my solution, this would be inconsistent with the way the problem is set up. This is that 1 over r term dominant over 1 over r square term? Because r square as r is very large, r tends to infinity, r is very large, so therefore uh, 1 over r term dominates over 1 over r square term. Right, that's the, right. and this is the, this is the dominant fall off. Yeah. Right. So, so there, there would certainly be, if you wrote an expansion out of your solution, there would also be a 1 over r squared term, but that's not the dominant fall-off term. It's, it's, it's this one. Okay. Um, so we can impose uh, yeah, boundary conditions. Um, B... For example, so not you, like, okay. Right. So for example, if we ask that the, the derivative is zero at the origin, then we will have eliminated this. If, if we can find a solution with that boundary condition, then we'll have eliminated this piece because that's not consistent, okay? But can we... Okay. Well, if we now look at um, r equals zero, we can write our solution now as um, a plus c r to the four. Okay. But what we've decided we can do, we've eliminated this other piece, and so therefore we calculate del squared phi. Well, clearly this piece is gone. Uh, let's see. This is going to be okay, if we take one derivative of this. This is four c r cubed. So that's four c r to the fifth, and so we've got uh, twenty. Is that right? Five uh, should be squared. Two, 
Yeah, right, right, right. Okay, so we get this, right? And so our, the, um, and this has to equal, as we go towards uh, small r, this has to equal, approximately equal minus r squared, right? So c is minus 1 over 20, okay? Now, the reason I'm going through all this detail about what may seem a very minor, I mean, we don't care about doing all these expansions because we're going to solve this thing numerically, but we want to actually get a picture of what's happening. And the main point here is that C is, is negative, okay? So this is going to have some uh, uh, negative power. And so now we can see that our solution Okay. Large r. Right? For large r, it's got to fall off as 1 over r. And this, this constant here has to be positive. Right? It's, it, if you think of it as it's like some mass, it's positive. So this has to fall to 0 from above. And it has to reach some uh, this is phi naught. Right? Whatever phi naught is, it has to decrease from there, right, as, uh, as r to the 4, okay? And so then the question is what happens in here, okay? Now, you could say, now the question is, is can phi naught be 0, right? Well, if phi naught is 0, it starts here. So if 0, then... Okay, if it starts here at zero, okay, then we know it, it decreases. We know that it does this, so it's going to have to do something like this with, you know, an undetermined number of wiggles in between, okay? So we have this option, okay, but we have the other option, which is that it come, maybe it just comes up gently to some solution, okay? All right, so the question is, can, can we do this? And one of the motivations for going through this uh, laborious exercise um, is to, to demonstrate the, one of the techniques for, for analyzing these kinds of solutions. I mean, certainly I could have just given, said, here's the problem, here's the boundary conditions. I know there's a solution, go find it, right? But in practice, you... you Life is not like that. And you come across some system, you say, here's my, my elliptic equation, and then there's like, uh-oh, does this have a solution? Am I going to waste my time? I, I've, I've been there, right? You, you, you write your code, and then you don't, and of course the code doesn't work. The code never works, right? And then, you know, days, weeks, months later, it still doesn't seem to work. Like, have I just got the code wrong, or does this problem not actually have a solution, right? And you very quickly would like to convince yourself it just doesn't have a solution, right? <laughs> because then you can just go and, and do another problem, okay? So it's, it's very important to be able to uh, have some tools to, to analyze whether this is going on. Okay, so having um, said that, well, based on this picture, if we have some solution like this, this the, the problem, uh, the solution must have an extremum somewhere, okay? Okay, so at, at an extremum, phi prime equals zero, right? That's, that's what an extremum is. And if we expand out our operator, right, the operator is right, is, is, is phi double prime plus two over r times phi prime. At the extremum, phi prime is zero. So at Um, right. 
right? We'll have, sorry, F. Right? You will have this. This will be the, at that particular point, this is the, the equation that's being, must be satisfied, and this is less than zero. Right? Because this, this piece here is, is positive over the entire domain, and there's a minus sign, so, so phi double prime is less than zero. So if phi double prime is zero, there is less than zero, then the solution must have a maximum, right? Okay, so problem number one. So clearly, we have a problem. All right, if we want this kind of solution, we have to have a maximum and a minimum somewhere. But any kind of extremum, the only extremum we're allowed is a maximum. Okay? Okay? Okay, there is no, no minimum is allowed, so, sorry. Okay. All right. Okay, what have I done? Where's my missing page? Uh -huh. Interesting. Okay. The crucial page is missing, so this is going to be tricky. All right. So, okay, that's fine. Okay. So now let's imagine we have uh, a solution that behaves a bit differently where it still goes to, um, or it doesn't go to zero. All right. Now, it cannot go to zero anymore, but it could go to some number and it could go like this, right? There could be a maximum somewhere else, right? Right? This is now possible, okay? Um, just a second. I just want to make sure I make this argument correctly, otherwise it will be... Where did I put this? Yeah, right. We know this kind of solution is not possible because it has to approach uh, this point from, from below, right? So it, it also can't do, I mean, to do this, it would have to go like this, and then again, there'd be a minimum, and it's not allowed, right? So the only kind of solution that's possible is, is, is actually a rather dull one, which is something like this, okay? So this is the, the form of the solution, okay? And so if we now uh, solve this, and this is what, uh, yes? I'm sorry? Uh, it, it can't have a maximum here because we know that it has to approach this value from below, okay? And if it approaches this value from below, then it has to have a minimum in order to have a maximum over here. And no minimums are allowed. Okay. Okay. All right. So, so this is the form of the solution. And so now, now the problem has so appropriate boundary conditions. Uh, that the, the derivative is zero at the, at the origin, um, and that phi is zero, phi is... Okay, or oh, that the, the solution go, uh, goes to zero at large r, okay? And I will talk soon about what you can... The, this should already be ringing alarm bells because uh, you only have a finite size computer um, and you, so you don't, uh, you don't want to try and put your boundary condition at 
at infinity. In practice, of course, what you will do is you will choose some large R and you will just set it to zero there. And you can solve for increasingly large values of R for the outer boundary and then see what effect this has. And at some point you say, okay, it's having so small effect that I don't care anymore. Okay? Um, but there are also other tricks which I'll talk about in a, in a moment. All right. Good. Okay. How are we for? Yes. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, because I want to, oh, I have to put some boundary condition, right? And the, the easiest kinds of boundary conditions are a Dirichlet boundary condition where I specify a value, but I don't know what this value is from the equation. And there's a, um, uh, there's going to be a unique solution. Okay, and so if I choose, I don't know, I want it to be a half or something, then that, that may not be an appropriate choice. So, but for, for this kind of solution, I certainly know, I know from, that, from the form that I wrote down that it goes as r to the 4, right, that the solution is now r to the 4, right, so phi prime, uh, and so phi prime of zero, zero, right? If I evaluate this at, at r equals zero, I've got zero. Okay. Um, I mean, this is this plus plus higher order terms, right? The 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 dominant the next dominant term after the uh, constant has to be r to the four near the or, near the origin, and after that it's higher order terms, and so that means that definitely the derivative has to be zero at the origin. And so that's uh, a very fine boundary condition to impose. I mean, I could, I could impose that the second derivative is zero as well, because that's also true. Um, but I know, how to, I know trivially how to impose a Neumann boundary condition. So why not? E either is, that's fine. Um, if I happen to know what the, this limiting value was, then I could, of course, impose that, but I don't know that. That will, by imposing just this uh, condition, you will find that the solution, it just finds the correct value at, at uh, the origin. Okay. Um, okay. Any other questions about this problem? Um, hmm? Is which co right that we have by, by doing this we've eliminated the, the one over r piece yeah so because the one over r we can always given a solution we can always add one over r some you know two over r three over r whatever four thousand over r and it's a valid solution of this equation right so the the solution is un is determined up to a con up to uh, a constant and a one over r Right. So the constant is, 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 um, is fixed by saying that we want the solution to go to zero at infinity. Right? I mean, I could, I could shift the whole solution up or down. Right? So, so I can't remember this value. It's 0.4 something, I think, from memory. So I could say I actually want uh, the solution at the boundary to be 1. And then this value would be 1.4. And right? it would just push the whole solution up. And I could, so given the solution, I can certainly shift it up and down by a constant, and I can also add to it um, a constant over r, if I wish. And that's a completely valid solution of the equation. Okay. How does b plus e r to the power 4 ensure at phi r tends to infinity? I'm sorry? Goes to zero. The condition is, as r tends to infinity, phi should go to zero. Yes. How does that solution ensure that fact? So this is just near r equals zero. This is true. So this is just an expansion close to r equals zero. So this will will very quickly become untrue. Um, yeah, and if you if you wish, when you solve this uh, numerically, you could even um, 
test this, right? I mean, you can, you can determine from your solution these two constants, right? And then you could plot uh, the, uh, the, you know, you could just plot this function and, and you will see this will go like this, right? So, so cl this is, uh, is it B? Right, the, this thing will, will very closely mimic the solution at small r, but then it will, will deviate. Um, Why? Well, I, I guess long before that. Um, if this is a thousand, then this guy's gone. Okay. Um, all right. Okay, it's quarter past. Maybe I should should break here. I was going to talk about the this different differencing of the. Okay, I think we just stop for a few minutes and then we. Carry on. Start again. Most people seem to be be here. Um, okay. I, I'm not sure if anyone, many people actually moved from their seats. But anyway. Okay. So one final thing I wanted to discuss about this problem was um, dealing with the outer boundary. Okay. And dealing uh, in uh, in numerical relativity, where you have to, if you're dealing with, if you're talking about um, well, I guess actually a lot of systems. I'm thinking of doing black hole space time and so on. But in a lot of cases, you have a problem. The outer boundary is a big problem because uh, the only place where you know something really concretely about your physical system is at infinity, is at spatial infinity or, or time-like infinity, some some flavor of infinity, and you want a solution, so you want to produce two black holes. Black holes are very compact things, right? And they are, if you're talking about two black holes that are in orbit, they're probably very, very uh, small distance apart. And so you're only, in terms of them, you're only interested in a very small region. But in order to, to, to apply appropriate boundary conditions where you know what the physics is, you want infinity. And so infinity is, is, a, is a big problem. And usually what you have to do is use... Uh, have a boundary which is much closer in, I mean, you know, dramatically closer in, right? So, for example, if I do, if I look at, look at a, a binary black hole system uh, for two stellar mass black holes, right? These things are so compact, right? That the the outer the, the two black holes, are the, you know, basically stellar mass. If I take my, you know, I do everything in geometrical units, so I'm not, nothing looks worrying. But if I take my computational domain of my simulation, which looks, it goes out to some very large radius, and I'm, I can extract uh, gravitational waves out at this, on some large sphere, very far from the, the two objects, and have a much further uh, outer boundary where I know it's far enough out that any junk that comes in there from my approximations is, is very small, and so on. If I actually look, what is the the distance, the physical size of my domain for two uh, stellar mass black holes, it may actually be smaller than the radius of the sun, right? So, so my, my computational domain is actually very, 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 very small. Um, but I know enough about the, um, the fall-off properties of the fields that I'm calculating that I can impose boundary conditions that, that give me a reasonable solution. Um, so... Okay, so that, that's uh, um, a rather colorful example to illustrate what's going to happen in this, otherwise, this rather mundane example where I know that the solution falls off as 1 over r. Okay, so... I can... Okay, so one is to just say choose right and then set. All right, that's one option. Um, so for those of you watching at home, I don't know how much you have missed, uh, <laughs> but uh, for everyone here, right? So, right. So this. This boundary condition, there will still be some error here. I mean, you can't apply this. Clearly, you cannot put your boundary here. You're still in the wrong regime. You're still in this R to the fourth regime, right? Uh, but if you put it out at 
some distance, you, it'll, but well, you could apply that boundary condition there, it just will give you a very poor result, right? So, uh, but as you move further out, the, the determination, this, this will become more and more accurate and it will get this, this constant uh, more, uh, more correctly and in general give you a, certainly a better answer than the, uh, this naive application. The other trick you can do, and if you're really serious, uh, is to compactify. And compactification sounds very sophisticated, right? So this sounds like something you want to do. Um, in practice, it's of course more complicated, so you may not want to do it, but I'll just summarize very briefly the, the idea. So option three is to compactify. Right. So we could let R equal Right, we can make this transformation to this variable s. Now s is in the range of 0 uh, to 1. And r is in the range of 0 to infinity. Okay? So we've now, by making this coordinate transformation, we're very, very simply uh, turned our infinite domain into a, a nice finite domain. Okay? Um, actually, there's probably no reason for this to be a, a round bracket. I think you can just put your boundary at, um, at s equals 1. Okay? I won't go right through uh, what happens to your differential. I mean, you can now work through this right, to, to see how the differential operator changes. Essentially, um, now d by dr becomes... Um, Uh, yeah, basically 1 minus s squared ds. You get, essentially, this is what happens to, your, to a, a derivative operator. Um, and your overall operator becomes um, I'm pretty sure this is what happens to your differential operator. So you'll find if you, if you want to work through this and derive this, it, all sorts of you know, messy terms appear, but it actually simplifies into something relatively um, straightforward. Uh, and the source term becomes... Um, So the source term uh, transforms into this, this thing. And you can immediately see here that uh, um, right, that this goes as, as sort of like r squared close to, I mean, s, s, for very small s, for extremely small s, s and r are similar, right? And so it, it's small r or small s, you've got this s squared, which is like r squared, and for large, um, R, which is S close to 1, you have this fourth power, which is, is like the source term falling over as 1 over to the R to the 4. So it, it has, you can just check it has the right consistent uh, behavior. And so if you now um, uh, apply, use this system, you can now completely uh, solve the solution over the full physical, the full, full, full um, space. And what you will find is, right, Right. I mean, when they say compactify, this is no, no joke, right? If you have your solution, uh, say, from 0 to 1, right? If you look at that range, it's, it starts at whatever this fine order is and, and starts to fall off. And at very large R, right, if you look at it from out to, I don't know, a million, right, it looks, basically, you can't even see the features at, at um, the origin and it just seems to fall off like this, right? 
right? If you, if you look at it on this range, if you now look at it on this compactified, so these are both R, if you now look at it on your compactified domain, S from 0 to 1, right, you'll see that actually this, this solution essentially looks like this, right? So, so this feature at the, um, near the origin, which is very, has a very small range, it's a very compact feature, this gets expanded out to basically half of the domain uh, when you do this compactification. And then this fall off, which is really pretty boring, it's just this one over R fall off, is then captured in pretty much the other half of the domain, right? So because this, this, this is a solution that doesn't have lots of complicated features, it doesn't have all sorts of wiggles and, and fine structures to it, then, then compactifying like this is fine. It's very easy to get a very well-resolved solution. It just tends to be a bit trickier to, um, to code up. Um, right. The one th comment to make about compactification is this is obviously very attractive, right? Uh, but it's much easier to do this in, when solving elliptic problems than when solving hyperbolic problems. So in producing initial data, so we do the same, we do a similar trick, we produce binary black hole initial data, and I'll talk about that probably on Thursday, and you can get very accurate initial data, but if you want to do a, a, an evolution where you evolve the data, uh, compa compactifying the domain becomes much more complicated. And, uh, and this can be done, I mean, there are codes which, which do this to some extent, but it's never as simple as, as this. And one, one issue is, you can imagine if you have some dynamical system, let's say you have waves, gravitational waves coming out, you have now got between the, uh, the source and infinity, you have an infinite number of uh, gravitational wave cycles, and so there is no way to resolve all those gravitational wave cycles uh, on a finite grid. So, so there's just you know, an inherent problem with, with using compactification um, in an evolution problem. Um, and, uh, and you can go, well, there are ways around this. In principle, you can go to the this more interesting slicing conditions where you actually have a finite number of gravitational wave cycles, and then you compactify those. Um, but that's, that's beyond the scope of this course. Is the way to say that? Okay. <clears throat> okay. So there are two more topics I want to mention today. Um, uh, and then tomorrow I won't talk about numerical methods anymore. I'll talk about uh, black holes, black hole initial data. Uh, okay. So the other thing I want to talk about was one of the other things was nonlinear equations because usually when we're solving uh, the constraints in uh, general relativity, we have to deal with nonlinear systems. And the basic technique for dealing with nonlinear systems uh, is to turn them into linear ones. Okay? So, as an example, here is a, an example, and we could say phi prime. Okay, uh, so here is a, a pretty simple looking system. You notice now I've, I've chosen the boundary condition at the, at the uh, rightmost boundary to be 1, not 0, because obviously 0 is not a good idea here. Okay, all right. Now, one of the f first problem things you have to think about when you're presented with a, uh, a nonlinear elliptic equation is, uh, is, is there a solution, and are the solutions unique? Right? And uniqueness and existence of solutions is a uh, major mathematical topic, and particularly if you have a very complicated system, analyzing and determining and proving rigorously that there are solutions and that they are unique is actually very difficult. Now, you might say, well, existence shouldn't be a problem. If I can find a solution numerically, I'm done. Right? And, and certainly, Existence proof by example is, is fine. Existence proof by numerical example can be a little trickier because you may have found a solution, but it could be that if you were to push your code to higher resolutions, that something would go wrong and eventually you would find that really there isn't a solution, you've, you, you've fooled yourself. So, so existence is not always trivial. But let's assu assuming we do have a, a solution, the other question is, is, are the solutions unique? So in this case, we could ask, is, does this problem have a unique solution? 
uh, and there's a very powerful technique for checking checking this, which I, I want to summarize. So, uh, solutions, All right? So the way to do this is to sort of uh, standard proof by contradiction. So assume that phi one and phi two are um, solutions. Okay, so you have two solutions, phi one and phi two. That's you. Assume that, and that at the boundaries, phi and. And that they are equal at the at the boundaries. Okay. So if you found two solutions, uh, I mean, if something if, they, if they're different at the boundary, this is not somehow so interesting. You can say, well, I, I can adjust my boundary condition so I force them to be equal or something. Right. But if you found two solutions and at the boundary they are equal, you now ask, well, you, you, somehow if you found a you, yeah, right. The, 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 I'll just say that you, you they are. We just assume two solutions which are equal. They're equal at the boundary, and the question is, what are, are they equal in between? Okay. So now we consider a new problem. Okay. If these two are uh, solutions, then uh, this this thing should also be a solution. The difference of them, right? So. Right? We subtract. Yes? Um, no, I can write down that I can subtract the two equations, right? I'm sorry? You are not saying that phi bar is a solution. Phi bar is phi 1. The difference of phi 1 minus phi 2 is not a solution. Right, I'm not, right. I'm not saying, sorry, I'm not saying that this is a solution. I'm just saying I'm now considering this equation, right? Which is, is a subtraction of this equation written down for each of these two solutions, right? Okay, good. All right, so I've got this. Um, I now have this new system. Uh, and uh, and so now I want to solve, um, solve this equation. Right, this system. Now, if there is a non-trivial solution, right? By non -tri by tri non -tri uh, the trivial solution is at zero. If it's zero, then our proof is done, right? If 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 phi one minus phi two is zero, then phi one equals phi two, and there uh, we have uniqueness, right? So for a non-trivial solution, uh, there has to be either uh, a positive maximum somewhere in the interior or a negative minimum, okay? I should state that the other, the sort of more rigorous way to approach this is to actually linearize this equation first, right? And then, and then you do have um, essentially phi bar satisfying exactly the same equation because you've you've actually produced a linear equation. But you, you can also somehow for somehow sketching out a proof, you can also do it um, this way. So this. Of course, you must either, if we have a non-trivial solution, by what I mean that, right, that the, that on my boundary, uh, phi 1 minus phi 2 is 0 here and here. So uh, if there's a non-zero solution, then it has to do you know, something in between. It has to have either a positive maximum or a negative minimum um, or both. Yes? Why is that true? Hmm? 
the statement that it must have a positive maximum or a negative minimum because at the boundaries it's zero okay and so it's either zero everywhere in which case I'm done or if it's anything else it you know if it, if it starts at zero and ends at zero then there has to be a maximum you know it can go it can go up like this or it can go down like this or some combination but there has to be either a max positive maximum or a negative minimum okay or it's zero those are the three options okay all right so now consider a positive maximum all right now this has to be less than zero right if it's if it's a maximum then this has to be uh, less than zero. If we we are we are sorry, uh, right? And we assume here also that phi one. Uh, we assume some one has to be bigger than the other, right? So we the biggest solution we call phi one, and the smallest solution we call phi two. Okay. So phi one is bigger than phi two. Uh, what, yes. What do you mean by phi one is bigger than phi two? At which point is uh, it might they might cross? That's that's true. Um, well, I guess I'm essentially just this is just my labeling, right? So at this particular point where there is a um, a positive maximum, right? At a positive maximum, phi one must be bigger than phi two, right? Okay. All right. So here. Phi, phi 1 is greater than phi 2. Right, so here I don't have to actually have required anything. This is, you know, if this is the situation, then this must be true. Okay? And so then, 1 over phi, right? If, if this is bigger than this, then the inverse is smaller, so this is smaller than this, and so this is less than 0, and therefore my. Um, Source term, or if I put this over the other side, I've got a minus sign, 1 over 5 n squared. This is greater than 0. Okay? And so I now have a situation where uh, um, well, I could. Hmm? Sorry? But th this one is less than 0, right? Phi, phi 1. Phi 1 is bigger than phi 2, so 1 over phi 1 is less than 1 over phi 2, and so if I subtract them, I get something less than 0. Okay? Yes? I'm sorry? Yes? Yeah, I mean, you're, you're assuming some level of smoothness here. I, think. I mean, um, I mean it, yeah. I'm not sure... I'm not sure exactly what the smoothness requirements are here. I mean, if you've got a, well, yeah. I mean, it, I guess the, I guess the two derivatives have to be two derivatives have to be smooth through this point. Otherwise, it. No, this is the this is I'm applying the Laplacian to this, right? So this function is at a maximum. Phi 1 minus phi 2 is at some maximum. And so the Laplacian of it, the two derivatives of it must be, must be less than 0. Right? That's where a maximum has a negative second derivative. No, no. Phi, the, this function, phi 1 minus phi 2, is, 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 we can call this phi bar. I am, I'm assuming that phi bar is a maximum. Okay, and so this is phi bar. So del squared phi bar here must be less than zero if it's a maximum. Okay, I think this is. Uh, if okay, uh, it's a positive maximum, right? If if phi one minus phi two is greater than zero, then 
phi 1 is greater than phi 2. Okay? So I, I'm talking about a positive maximum in this function. Okay? So the function is positive, so phi 1 is greater than phi 2. And, it's second, and since it's a maximum, its second derivative is negative. Okay? All right? Okay, so is everyone. I, I feel so much stirring of discontent. This must, no, one, no one is convinced. That's what we're going to prove. Yeah. Okay. All right. I. S <laughs> Thank you. All right. So the point. Right. The point is that if I now look at this equation, right, this term is negative. This term is negative, and so this can't be zero. And so I have a contradiction. Right. Okay. And it seems that everyone got there before me, <laughs> which isn't fair because you were holding me up. But anyway. <laughs> so we have proved that we cannot have. Uh, that these are, are these must be just not um, a trivial solution of zero, and so phi one must be actually equal to phi two, and it's unique. To, you, are, you also have to check the other option, which is the negative minimum. But I, I, it's, it's the same kind of argument, uh, and I think you've got the idea now. So you can you can do that uh, at home. Right, right, right. Exactly. So the, the key thing that determines whether or not you can prove uniqueness of these nonlinear systems is a crucially the combination of this, this sign and this power. Right? So basically, the, the, it's, the, it's, it's, it's these two. That, right, so if this was cubed, it wouldn't work. But if this was cubed and this was negative, it would work, and so on and so forth. Right? So it's, it's, it's very important. Um, that the power is uh, is correct. Okay. And the, okay. Right. And so that's why. And so yeah. You basically you can you can go through this these kinds of examples for, for many different powers. Okay. All right. Um, all right. And so if you just just to mention, uh, you might think, okay, is this just a, a a check, right? Does it always you work? Well, it doesn't always work. As I said, if there's this odd power, it doesn't work. And I can certainly think of a very simple example for you um, uh, of an equation where you do not have uniqueness, uh, which looks very similar, which is this one, which is the simple harmonic oscillator, right? If I take the simple harmonic oscillator and I apply that at 0 and at 1, I have the solution is 0, of course, I have an infinite number of solutions because I may choose all kinds of different frequencies. So uh, you can, so you now can prove <laughs> by this principle, by this procedure, that this does not have a unique solution. And I hope you don't end up proving that it does have a unique solution uh, because it's a simple harmonic oscillator. Okay. All right. Just sorry. All right. That's uh, these things. All right, so if I want to solve this problem now, now I've so shown that there's unique solutions, I'm very happy. I would now like to actually see what one of those solutions is. The trick is now to, uh, to linearize the problem. OK. So we say, let's let phi, the correct solution, equal some guess of the solution. Let guess All right. So we say that was some guess for our solution, and we don't. And we are now solving for a correction to the solution. Okay. And so now our the the, the problem becomes. Um, and then you, you and now you expand this out. You assume this is small, 
and you get sorry that's phi bar You get this, expand it out. And so now you have a new problem. Some problem? No? Mm -hmm. right. So now you have a new problem to solve. Right. So now you are solving, instead of solving the original equation, well, it's not that one, uh, this one, you are now solving this new equation for this correction function. And this is what you solve for. And, and now the source term is, is, the, is your original operator applied to your guess function. Right? So, so for example, if your initial guess for the solution was 1, which is a perfectly fine initial guess, right? this would be, then be 0, and this would be... 1, right? So you just have minus 1 here, and then you would solve this equation um, with, a, with a source term over here of just minus 1, and that would give you some delta phi, right? And so then, well, I'll stop over here. Right, so now your solution becomes this. You've just, you apply your, your delta phi to your, your original guess, and then you have a new solution. Uh, and now you, you repeat. Um, actually, in some sense, this is this guy. Until um, Okay, and so now you keep doing this, and eventually, you know, the, the, this, this, iterate, this increment should get smaller and smaller, of course, right? and you should get successively closer to the, um, the correct solution, and so you, you, you basically want that. One, right, and then you sort of have to, you can define some. Uh, some norm, which I, which most natural thing to do is to, to apply this over um, all the the grid points. So something like right. This would be your your criteria. Yes. Yes. Oh well, now we now we saw that we now solve this this numerically, right? So I'm sorry, by I supply, I have to supply something. Yes, you you apply uh, supply an initial guess for phi phi bar, and now you have um, to, and now you have this new equation that you solve for this correction delta del phi, uh, and you need boundary conditions, of course, on del phi. So, for example, this problem I have here, I, the most natural solution for a guess would be phi bar is 1. And so now the boundary conditions on uh, this guy, the del, del phi of 0 equals del phi 1 0, right? Because the boundary conditions are on the, on the correction, now that they, this doesn't change. Right? Uh, sorry, this is wrong. Uh, that one's right. This one is Delphi prime, 
right? It's the same, same condition as on phi. So you solve this with these boundary conditions. You get yourself a del, a del phi. You then add that onto your original guess, and you've got the new, new solution. And then you now use that as your guess, and you repeat the process. And you hope that delta phi gets smaller each time, and you, you can check, each, you can calculate this, this norm, this difference between successive solutions, right? You just, you add this up over all the grid points, and this gives you some measure of the difference between the two solutions, and this would get successively smaller, often very quickly, like orders of magnitude change at each step, and once this has reached some tolerance, uh, you say, okay, I'm, I'm happy, I'm done. And then you've solved the equation. Okay. All right. Uh, the last thing I wanted to talk about was uh, relaxation methods for 2D systems, which uh, you're not going to do any 2D systems in the, the labs, but I will just mention very briefly um, how you deal with these. So if you come across a two-dimensional system, you're not uh, uh, horrified. So actually, I get a bigger piece of chalk. So, if you look at it, the 2D equation, right, if it's a, simple, a similar kind of thing, right, now you have two dimensions, and if you now finite difference this thing, right, let's assume that our dx so let's, let's discretize by the same amount in, in x and y just to make life simple we can do it more generally and then the equations are longer but it's, it's, it's all the same kind of thing and then you've got So now you, you have to finite difference in x, finite difference in x, you finite difference in y, the two indices, and now you've got you know, twice as many uh, appearances of the, the function at the, the point. Okay? And so to solve this, right now if I write this, if you now write this, okay, if you want to write this as a matrix, right, well you have a problem because you've got two directions here, and you certainly do not want your nice matrix to turn into a box, right? This is not nice. So, um, introduce index i, which is j. Okay, so now we just take these things and we just we take our, uh, instead of having a, a 2D array of points, we now translate this into a long run 1D array of points. Okay? And this is, this is nothing geometrical. All we're doing is relabeling everything. Right? So instead of having you know, 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 3, all the way up to 1N, then 2, 1, 2, 2, 2, da, 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 it all just gets turned into one big long thing. And so, so for example, the point 1, i equals 1, j equals 1, if you feed into here, becomes i equal 1. So that's good. That looks consistent, right? Two, one, right? So this would now increment up in, in i. So if I said one, two, this would be two. One, three would be three and so on. But then when I get to increasing j, I get, sorry, what have I done? Have I got this the wrong way around? Uh, I've done this the wrong way around, sorry. This is i. Right, okay. So now, when I get to j equals 2, sorry, i equals 2, right, that appears in here. I got an extra n in here, and so this becomes i is n plus 1. And if I go all the way up to n m, right, i equals n, and right at the very end of my points, 
then I equals now M What have I done here? Sorry, this is this is M. Right, and so, so this is just a sort of a consistency check that this index basically is a, is consistently takes all of your points and turns the, and, and it rearranges them all on a line. And so now you can make a matrix with this index. So now you have your, your big, big matrix. But it's clear that if you now put all this into this matrix, this is not going to be a nice tridiagonal matrix. It's actually going to have bands. And so now you're going to have this band uh, matrix and so now solving it is going to be more expensive. You can't use this tridiagonal method anymore, and everything becomes much more difficult. And so what is usually done is what's called relaxation, which is similar to what we did with this nonlinear problem, is you basically you start with some, some guess and you, you iterate. And so what you can do is you can solve. So if we call this equation 1, you can solve 1. 4, 5, i, j, right? So I could actually write this as, I can rearrange this whole equation and say phi, i, j is written in terms of everything else, right? And so given uh, an initial guess, I can actually update, and this provides an update. Okay, and so it's possible then by just at each point solving this, to then take your original guess and to, to produce a, um, uh, an update. And so if you have, so there are various versions. There's the Jacobi method. All right, this is the last thing I'm going to do, so I'll, I'll almost finish here. Okay, the, the Jacobi method where you essentially, you take your whole solution, you calculate, and this is fixed, based on this solution, you calculate all of these updates, and then you, once you've calculated all of them, you put them in, in place. Right? So the Jacobi method is to um, compute sort of an update right? And this is rather slow. Okay, there is a, a modified method called Gauss-Seidel where what you do is you actually each time you have made an update, you, up, you successfully go through updating the points and once you've updated them, you use that updated value um, in your calculation, right? So by the time you've got to the last point on the grid, that's updated using the, the new information about all the other points. So in some sense that they're... Uh, you, you, you update as you go. So, um, so. Okay, and that's actually faster, which is great because that's also cheaper. You don't have to keep another copy of the solution. You just sort of naively go through updating the points. And this turns out to actually be, uh, be faster. And uh, the other thing you can do is what's called successive over-relaxation, where what you've done previously, right, is effectively you were saying, Right? Previously, what you were doing is you were essentially modify, you know, adding some um, correction to the solution everywhere. Right? So, so you, could, you, could rewrite, you can write this, this, this method down in a way that you basically are saying, I take my original solution and I add a correction. Okay? Now, what successive over-relaxation does is it says, actually, in many cases, 
you do better if you don't just add this solution, you add sort of more of this solution, more of this correction. So, And so you said this, this, this correction was, was good, but actually wasn't enough. I'm going to sort of beef it up a bit. Okay? And so in, 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 in practice, W is I mean, if W is 1, then you're just adding this naive correction. But you can actually do better by choosing some value here. And this will depend on, um, on the problem and, and on many, many things. But this is, tends to also be yet faster than this, this approach. So this is, is one way of doing... Um, uh, 2D problems. So here you're not you're not attempting in any way to invert this monster matrix. You are just essentially naively just trying to to, to solve the problem. Um, and there are a whole range of problems of increasingly sophisticated methods for dealing with uh, with this problem, right, which is still in the end a matrix inversion problem. And in a way, I think what I've told you about is, is the, are the main things that you need to know because if you say, okay, I want to use the conjugate gradient method or the biconjugate gradient method or the stabilized biconjugate gradient method or any of these methods, uh, it's very nice to go and read about how these methods work because there's lots of very clever ideas involved. But if you're using uh, Python or MATLAB or any of these codes, they're all in there. And you can just say, I've now I've coded up my problem. I know how to write my matrix out. Uh, and now I'm going to call the conjugate gradient method. Well, that didn't work very well. It wasn't stable. Okay, I'll call the, you know, the, this other method. And, and then you just try these different methods to see which one works, works best. But the main thing is being able to set up the problem and set up the boundary conditions. And then you can um, explore different methods, which are usually all provided. There's usually a whole suite of these, these methods that are provided now with most of these programming languages. Um, Okay, that's, that's it for numerical methods, and then tomorrow we'll get on to um, talking about black hole initial data.